Let's embark on a journey through dimensions in Across the Spider-Verse. The long-awaited sequel delves deep into the psychological side of each character. One character in particular stole the spotlight for me, and not just with their looks. With a runtime of 2 hours and 13 minutes, I would say Gwen's development and character dominates for almost exactly 50% of the film, concentrating on her struggles and story. Hi, I'm Adrian from Ember Nexus, and I'd like to present to you my video essay on Gwen Stacy in Across the Spider-Verse. The film begins with Gwen introducing us to Miles' story whilst playing the drums. Through her monologue, she establishes connections between Miles' experiences and her own, emphasising their similarities, an idea that will continue to be brought up throughout the film. All of her feelings surrounding Miles and the loss of her other friends and sacrifices she's made manifest into a solo that she only breaks from after multiple callings of her name. What? Remaining closed off, she rejects talking about her feelings and abruptly walks out on her band, heading home. On her way back, memories of her dear friend Peter flood her mind, forcing her to relive one of her most profound regrets, the inability to save him. This is where we realise how special Miles is to Gwen to be the first real friend she's had since Peter's death, emphasised further in her introduction from Into the Spider-Verse. And I don't do friends anymore. The song that plays throughout this scene is called Self Love. Obviously, the song is about loving oneself before others, which beautifully encapsulates Peter's aspirations to transform himself to better meet Gwen's supposed expectations. Overall, the song explores longing, emotional turmoil, and the complexities of self-worth in new environments. When she comes home, a brief reflection of her spider self can be seen in the window, as opposed to her usual self, symbolising how she places her self-worth in her secret identity. Mirrors and reflections serve as symbols of truth and reality, highlighting Gwen's inner conflict, where she grapples with who to be and struggles with the burden of keeping a secret in which there is no one to share it with. In the same vein, earlier we saw a reflection of Miles in the subway window, reflecting that she really does care for him. Finally, the placement of Gwen's reflection here, right before entering her own home, is significant for the fact that this is where she questions herself most. Of course, stemming from her father wanting her dead, thinking that she killed his daughter's best friend. This all resurfaces near the end of the movie, which I'll cover later. The rift between her and her dad is clear to be because of the Spider-Woman case, being a sensitive topic for Gwen twofold, haunted by the day she supposedly killed Peter and lost a friend. Again, another parallel is drawn here with Gwen needing comfort and her dad being there, sort of. His work pulls him away and it debatably takes priority. He sadly fails to be a dad, neglecting listening to his daughter first before pursuing his job, evidently having a very fixed mindset on Spider-Woman ever since her introduction to the city. Why wear a mask if you've got nothing to hide? In a powerful following visual sequence, Gwen unscrews the front of her bass drum where she stores her suit alongside a picture of her and Miles, a testament to his importance to her, seemingly being the reason she continues what she does. Gwen changes her mental state to be the superhero the city needs, rather than herself, a powerful conjunction to her tuning out distractions by physically turning off the radio, before jumping out the window and the drum section of her theme being put into full effect. It demonstrates to us, based on her comfort and outward expression in playing the drums, that she feels most in her element while swinging through the city as Spider-Woman. Following her fight with Vulture, Gwen collapses in exhaustion. Captain, come you on! Have the right I... to remain silent! You don't understand! <laughs> You don't understand. This is a gut-wrenching moment not just for Gwen, but for everyone in the audience. It is heartbreaking as we see George fire his gun in an attempt to gain better control of the situation. This revelation further adds to Gwen's emotional turmoil, which has already proved detrimental, learning that her dad really would shoot her over something she didn't do, an idea yet to be realised by her father, her identity still remaining unknown to him up until this point. Caught off guard and with no webs left, she is forced to surrender and makes the brave decision to reveal her face. This moment is a massive step for Gwen and an even bigger ask for her father to understand. In this moment, all she wants, or more accurately, all she needs, is someone who can listen, her dad to comfort her. Pleading with him, she yearns for any kind of understanding and acceptance. Instead, however, like before, he places his work above being a father. 
Merely 20 minutes into the movie, Gwen finds herself suddenly under more pressure than before after revealing her identity. Gwen grapples with the idea her dad would prioritize his line of duty as a police officer regarding her over their relationship and love for her. A similar dilemma faced by Miles, which is later addressed at the clock tower regarding whether he should confide in his own parents. I mean, my parents. I mean, maybe if I told them. Don't. Trust me on that. George now knows the identity of Spider-Woman to be his daughter and still believes she killed her own best friend. And now, granted with the opportunity, Gwen decides to leave him to travel to other dimensions, which are entirely unknown to her, away from the one person she has left, as she says. You're all I have left. Deciding between staying and going, it's clear her dad's actions have had a much more profound impact than the passing comments shown to us before, ultimately resulting in her leaving the one person she has left, feeling abandoned and betrayed. All of this underscores the effect her father's actions have had and the challenges one must face in such a position, sacrificing their own personal needs for the greater good. Gwen carries the burden of protecting the entire city on her own, something Jess mentions. You can't just leave her here. She's doing this on her own. She was thrust into this position of responsibility and has and continues to endure major sacrifices to fulfill her obligations, knowing and living in fear of the consequences of failing to do so. Despite her exhaustion and injuries from the fight, Gwen remains dedicated to her responsibilities until everything is sorted. When her father approaches her amidst the rubble, her emotional state abruptly switches back to being alert, a heightened sense of panic upon realizing she's out of webs. This scene focuses its attention on identity and trust, seen resonating throughout this film and the previous, along with the overwhelming pain of rejection by a close loved one. A short interjection here for Miles. Recently, I watched this short that brought my attention back to Miles' aspirations following school. As we see in both movies, Miles possesses incredible artistic talent and evidently has genuine passion for his work. It's safe to assume that this is a career he would likely want to pursue in some form. However, in Across the Spider-Verse, we learn that he intends to follow quantum physics work in New Jersey, away from New York. And why is this? The answer lies in his longing to reunite with his friends. Miles wants to aid in the research of such technology, wanting to contribute to its development. It shows the lengths he is willing to go to to make this his life's work just for the chance of seeing them again. If nothing else, this truly shows how much Peter, Gwen and the others meant and still do mean to him. We next encounter Gwen when she's arrived in Miles' bedroom, after he's looked through his sketchbook to cool off after getting grounded, many, if not all of the pages containing multiple drawings of her. It's much easier to say in hindsight, but you can tell slightly that Gwen is distracted by something. I felt like their reunion was a little… flat? It's been over a year because of this time skip and that's all. Again, all of this is a little more understandable when you realise why she's really here, and also taking into account that she's been able to talk to other Spidey people who would understand her situation, and she isn't as desperate for an outlet, Hobie in particular perhaps. Look, I quite like his character now, he's cool, but god damn if I didn't feel a little bit of betrayal when he was first introduced. Let's skip ahead a bit in the movie to explore his character in more depth, and then we can go back to a few of the best scenes in the movie. Now, in fairness, he does completely snake Gwen out in front of Miles, but you might be thinking, why would he do that? Well, just a few minutes ago, apparently, This romantic tension is so palpable, how can you guys even concentrate? Saying that Gwen left her jumper at his place, before she then disregards it, before he then follows up by saying that she also left her two Toothbrush? Wendy, you left a jumper around my place. Well, what's a jumper? It's a sweater. How many sweaters do you have? Uh, that's that's not my name. And your toothbrush. Wait, what? Where's my chucks? <laughs> and just to compound matters, she's even wearing his shoes. I'm not going to be a normal villain, Spider-Man. That's right. I'm gonna crease your J's. No, you you won't. Yes. No, no. I'm gonna crease your J's, Spider-Man. <laughs> and wow, this is where everything just goes to shit when they're fighting the spot. Everyone is now wildly put off and the spot is able to get to the super collider. Right, so now that we've briefly taken a look at the dynamics between Hobie and Gwen, which will also prove relevant later, we can now return to when Gwen first entered Miles' dimension, Earth 1610. Bummer. Is Spider-Man grounded? Gwen and Miles swing effortlessly through the city, with Gwen challenging Miles to various paths and stunts, all of which he adeptly handles in his own unique style. This all showcasing his worthiness for when we finally get to how long Gwen's been a part of this elite team. I'd also like to mention how Gwen not only leads their physical movement through Brooklyn, but also takes charge of the conversation, a very deliberate choice on her part. Her mind is racing, having to deal with an anomaly whilst also wanting to talk to Miles. Miles then directs them both to the clock tower where we saw him pre 
previously with his sketchbook. Overlooking the city, Gwen walks around to the underside of the platform, advising he not tell his parents, reflecting on what happened after she told her dad. This demonstrates the worlds apart they feel, separated. Not just that, but her entire life got flipped upside down. Miles swings around to the other side to see the world from her perspective and comforts her with Maybe some things are supposed to be just for us. That's a nice way to think about it. As his confidence grows following affirmation from her, he moves closer. That's different. Yeah? How's that? I don't know. You and me, it's... We're the same. This line from Miles is a bit of copium, but it tells Gwen that she's not alone like the star of the movie would lead us to believe she feels, by reiterating that what they experienced was the same. Gwen then shifts her weight to lean on Miles. A wide shot then dollies out from the clock tower, but unlike at the beginning of the scene where they were upside down, the world now appears the wrong way up. Thematically, this represents Gwen's shift in perspective, as she says herself. That's a nice way to think about it. Once Gwen finally arrives at the anomaly where, unbeknownst to her, Miles has followed, we watch as the mounting pressure and immense stress pile on. Torn between needing to fulfill her job going after the spot and being extremely unwilling, knowing that she will never be able to return, she has to accept that she won't ever see Miles again. And you can tell that she breaks a little inside, admitting, Did you go see your little friend? What? No, Miles? I mean, I just, look, I had to know how he was. I'll never see him again. This is also a moment of acceptance for Miles. He will never lay eyes on her again either. Miles. Miles follows Gwen to Mumbatton, where as a result of the crushing pressure she is feeling, ends up saying, We shouldn't have ever come to see you. Which Miles takes pretty well, all things considered. No matter. What's important is that she didn't mean it, and while being stressed is no excuse, it's at least understandable. Not to worry though, because Pav has got the shippers back with this one, keenly calling out how much they must like each other. <laughs> You weren't invited and you came anyway! Right? Hey, you guy must be in love with you. Okay, no. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm very good at reading no, people. Not. This romantic tension is so palpable. How can you guys even concentrate? Once inside, Alchemax Pev asks, Hey, does he know about Hobie? What should I know about Hobie? Oh, oh, looks like he did not know. Bit of a whoops there, but the scene that follows this we spoke about earlier, so if you need to go back, here's a timestamp. From their escape from Alchemax, Miles is slower to recover, and Gwen is the first one to come back for him. She consistently supports him when he starts falling behind again to pull him out, and then one last time right before they leave, demonstrating their camaraderie and how Gwen in particular isn't just going to leave him on his own. She wants him there with the rest of them. The truth when she said, Look, if it was up to me, you- I know, I know, I know. And counteracting what she said earlier. We shouldn't have ever come to see you. The subtext under that line was actually, I should have never have come to see you, that way you'd still be safe at home. I'm now going to look at this small part of the scene with hindsight. According to Miguel O'Hara, canon events should not be disrupted. So when Miles goes to save Inspector Singh, Gwen tries to stop him. I got him, I got him! Miles! Don't worry, thread the needle, ring the bell, right? It's too dangerous. I'll be okay, I promise. Miles, no! Miles promises her he'll be okay, referring back to a move they did before. Now, now, let's go! Thread the needle! Don't worry, thread the needle, ring the bell, right? But really, the driving reason isn't the fact that she doesn't believe he can do it, because she knows he's more than capable, but more the fact that in doing so, he'll disrupt the canon. She knew Inspector Singh had to die, and her reasoning behind not wanting Miles to go was torn between keeping the canon intact and him risking his life. We'll cover this more shortly. Once the dust settles, the gravity of the situation becomes more real for her, and she's fully driven by her feelings for him. There's a small parallel to Gwen's relationship with Peter, where Miles slash Peter are crushed, yet Gwen could have done more to prevent the outcome. It's important to remember that Miles is also Gwen's first real friend after Peter, and she believes she just lost her best and only friend once again. Miles! Inside Spider Society HQ, the theme of jealousy emerges. Gwen and Hobie recount how many missions they've done together, with Gwen downplaying how many they've really gone on. Okay, I did all the work. How you! How many missions have you been on together? Oh, not that A couple many. dozen. That's cool. Miles feels somewhat dejected until he runs into Spider Bite. Clearly there's some chemistry here, which Gwen picks up on and says, Can we just keep moving? When Miles attempts to wrap up the conversation, Gwen webs him and pulls him away. See you around. Let's go! Hey, good luck out there, man. Okay, bye! This romantic tension is so palpable. To give props to Hobie, inside HQ, he shows he isn't exactly interested in Miguel's alignment, and he does want what's best for Miles. Bet this doesn't even do anything. 
Maybe it did before you ripped it out of a wall. Whether that's because he's looking out for my trouble, so. aka Gwen and then Miles because of her, or just because he knows what will happen to Miles, we're not sure. But he does strongly suggest against fighting with 2099. Just don't enlist you know what war you're fighting. Shortly after, he also has this interaction with Mayday. Taking a crap on the establishment, I salute you. Peter pulls Miles and Gwen together, and their shared expressions reflect their similarities, reinforcing this idea to the audience. This is their funny face. This one is the studious one. That's why Gwen tried to stop you. Miles! I thought you were trying to save me. I was. I was doing both. This line from Gwen about doing both comes up again just minutes later when Miles is faced with a conflict, reflecting again how similar the two are, arguing, I can do both! Remember in Mumbatton when Gwen said that she should have never have come to see him, but we gave her the pass because of everything else going on and what she really meant? We shouldn't have ever come to see you. A similar thing happens here, but I'm going to be a little harsher on Miles. I will not deny the weight of what he's just been told with his dad dying, but his thinking is shown to be clear and logical, piecing together the only reason Peter is here is to let him down softly. So when he directs his attention to Gwen... Hold on, hold on! You're right, Gwen. You should have never come to see me. You know he means it. And she knows it too, starting to tear up. Being captured, Hobie reminds Miles of his advice from earlier. Just need to hold you a few days. <laughs> and makes his escape. That's for the record, I quit. Hobie also seizes the opportunity to leave now that he's provided Miles with as much as he can and likely believing his drummer is in safe hands. During the chase, Peter overhears a conversation between Jessica and Gwen, which leads him to pull out of the chase. But my gut says that you your head! Peter makes the connection that he's been manipulated for this flaky cause. Gwen saves, or potentially more accurately, briefly captures Miles, but he physically and metaphorically cuts off his connection to her, reinforcing his line from earlier about her never coming to see him. All right, Gwen. You should have never come to see me. Unlike Gwen, who counteracted her words with actions, here, Miles doubles down. Peter manages to pull Miles away from the chase and talk to him where he shares Miles is the reason he had a kid, hoping they'd turn out like him. During their conversation, Miles mentions how he just wanted to be with them, his friends, before saying, But this thing isn't what I thought it was. This echoes Hobie's earlier advice to him right before meeting Miguel. Just don't enlist, you know what war you're fighting. And what I worry about most. The chase continues on the train where Miguel pushes hard into the mental game, trying to throw Miles off. I love you, Miles. While truthful, 2099 becomes unreasonably harsh with Miles. It was, they won't look out for you like us. And Peter breaks, saying that. This isn't what we talked about! You talked about this? And he never lets anyone. Revealing that all of his friends did know about him being the original anomaly. Tell him that he doesn't belong there. You knew? You, you all knew? His relationships with all of them strained once again, trust falls through the floor, and Rio's talk with him becomes more and more conspicuous. He never doubts that he is loved. Also relating back to Hobie, Miles asserts his independence in that he doesn't need anybody, and uses his venom blast against Miguel, the ultimate figure of strength and power. Right before retreating back to the clubhouse, Miles says a final goodbye to Gwen, tripling down on his decision to leave her. Bye. Slowly realizing her mistakes that led Miles and her relationship up to this point, Miles promptly uses the go home machine before 2099 snaps about him escaping, where Gwen defends him. Why didn't he listen? Maybe you weren't hard enough on him. Furthermore, in another parallel to Miles, she questions breaking the cannon, just as Miles did before. It's what happens when you break the cannon. How do you know? Do you know for certain what happens if he breaks the cannon? Her small attack on Miguel is not something arbitrary, but comes from a deep-rooted belief that she's been suppressing for well over a year. Amid pressure and overwhelming emotions and decisions, she demonstrates a strengthened moral compass, supported by substantial reasoning and purpose, alongside meaningful relationships, a considerable development from what we saw from the first movie. Miguel turns around threatening her, but also not answering the question either, forcing her to allege. And this may just be my favourite shot, and it's the one that's led to this video. The camera cuts to focus on her shoes, which keep in mind are Hobie's. Still carrying part of his flair and identity has given her the courage to question the establishment he so clearly hated. But this is still something new to her, resulting in her momentarily slipping. 
I truly want to emphasize the significance of this shot. She missteps and slips, but the ground she's standing on doesn't crumble, unlike what we've seen before. Like I've mentioned, she took a misstep. Now, whether you interpret that to be joining this group, hurting Miles, or anything else she regrets, maybe even challenging 2099, or even all of the above, I don't care. What's important is that her purpose and reasoning remains firm, and it serves as a visual representation of her resilience. It highlights that while she may stumble in her choices, her structural foundation behind her decisions remain intact and recoverable. Unlike Miguel, Gwen's ideologies have been fostered out of love and compassion, not necessity. His impulsive and reckless nature are what led to the destruction of the new dimension he went to, supposedly. Gwen not falling and still being able to recover herself shows how quickly she can identify her wrongdoings and can adapt and rectify these mistakes, only reaffirming her commitment to her now transformed cause. Gwen is physically forced into the go-home machine, and there's a sense of remorse from Jess when Gwen mainly addresses 2099. We are supposed to be the good guys. We also cut to spider Bite and Peter, who at the very least show fear of 2099 and what he's doing. This set of events involving Gwen and Miles has made their friends realize the gravity of the situation and how wrong it is. Gwen is forcefully hurled into her dimension, shown to be somewhat hurt and exhausted, similar to the Vulture fight. She's ended up back in the same place. Based on Into the Spider-Verse, we know that even when it's unexpected, Gwen is more than capable at landing in a controlled and safe manner through these dimensional portals. She attempts to access the Spider-Verse through her watch, but it's been blacklisted. Expressing her frustration, she... <laughs> It's the culmination of all of her regrets and understanding that she was played. Helplessness consumes her in determining what to do best for the people closest to her. Sneaking home, we come across the same window from the beginning of the movie, only this time, it's different. Gwen is returning home in her spidey outfit, and the reflection shows her usual self. This is a powerful representation of self-discovery and realization. She is embracing her hidden identity in her home where that was evidently previously unwanted. It personally shows her transformation and character arc, potentially stemming from her talk with Miles at the clock tower, accepting both identities where her true self isn't determined by the costume, but what lies within. Finding that the one picture she had of herself and Miles is missing from her bass drum, she enters the living room where it lies on the table in front of her sleeping father. The picture itself holds significance for her, as Miles is the reason she's doing this. Not just because she wants to save him, but the idea keeping her going through tough times has been him. This is the one physical memory she has of them together. It was taken shortly after they met properly, the bus scene where they spoke about the goober. In that conversation, Miles gave her something she had been deprived of for months. Affection. He was a friend she told herself she didn't need, but now that the offer was there, she took it up and came to the realization that life is better when shared with others, fueling this pursuit. Gwen turns to leave having collected the one thing she came for. Her dad quietly follows her, Gwen only noticing after he turns on the light right before she exits through the window. She continues to leave before he asks for her to look at him. This is presumably the first time she has returned home since leaving 16 months ago. It's clear that even still, she holds disdain against her father for not being a dad to her first before being a cop. Helplessly, he stands and asks what's going on. And from his perspective, we have to understand Gwen's disappearance has left him with no one and nothing. Gwen's mother died when she was a young girl, and now Gwen herself, only 16 or 17, has run away from home and hasn't been sighted in over a year. Gwen reasonably still hangs on tight to the fact that her dad was next to willing to shoot her, and she takes a jab at him with where she's been. Where have you been? Just been, uh, out murdering all my friends. However, she sets aside her anger and commendably praises her father's work, connecting back to the start of the film where her dad claims that Spider-Woman shouldn't need a mask if she hasn't got anything to hide. Gwen attaches his police badge to her mask in an effort to live up to his expectations, yet she admits she still failed. Acknowledging that she has these incredible powers that far surpass anyone else in this dimension, she exposes how she can't help the people she cares about. She reveals how lonely she's felt and remains still, arguably making her more depressed and further outcasted from society. Her line of people only knowing half of who she is is really powerful and it's a responsibility all Spideys have to take on. And they can only know half of who I am. Whether they want to or not. Being Spider-Man is a sacrifice. That's the job. They are not just one person, they have two entirely different personas that can never entwine. The pressure this creates is insurmountable, driving rifts through their relationships and themselves. It's the same reason Miles felt so hurt and betrayed when he realized Peter, Gwen, and his other friends could have come to see him. There was no one else he could talk to about this stuff, no one else who would or even could understand. 
So conflicted in what to do, who to go to, and who to trust, Gwen quickly loses the most important person, herself. Attempting to find clarity in the muddy void her life has formed around her, she knows at least one thing she has to do, and it's for the same reason she returned. Miles is her beacon through the storm, guiding a safe way back, and she knows that she can't lose another friend like she did with Peter. Not again. Not with Miles. Seemingly appearing as if he hasn't changed, her dad tries to justify his actions of that night, and Gwen willfully surrenders, sick of his mindset and sarcastically telling him to arrest her then. This is a major internal conflict for George, having to admit to his daughter that he quit. He can't bear to show his weakness in such a way that damages him so badly, but he does anyway. Gwen slowly begins piecing together what all of this means while he continues, saying that everything he's worked up for until now, his hard work, his dedication, it was all for nothing. He's finally able to bring himself to face her. This whole thing doesn't matter anymore. You're the best thing I've ever done. George breaking the cannon by quitting his job and not becoming captain also means he is no longer destined to die right in front of her. A revelation that proves you can save everybody. You can do both. Shown that her father really does care for her, in compassion, she web shoots him over to her. Again, the combination of her secret and casual identities are mixed into one, where he embraces and accepts them both. In an act to show Gwen that he is on her side, Spider-Woman or Gwen, he hands over a box Hobie left containing a scrap together watch. The guy who left it was a real piece of work. After Gwen and Miles both arrive at Miles' house, Miles after a few minutes realises he's been sent to the wrong dimension, glitching out. Gwen then also gets the memo through her spidey sense. Shortly following this, her spidey sense goes off again when Miles gets knocked out on the rooftop of the building. Gwen overhears his parents talking about his whereabouts and how he's probably off with that girl, her. I think it's crucial that Gwen overhears his mother acknowledging how much he'd lit up around her. You saw the way he lit up? Her. It's additional wanted security for Gwen that he really did miss her while she was gone, but it also makes her truly realise how much that relationship meant to him, deepening the impact of her decisions. He wasn't exaggerating at the clock tower, he was even underselling it maybe. Knowing this, she can put together how crushed he was to find out that she hadn't returned when she had the ability to. Rio then says, I just hope she doesn't get in her. Seeing how much his mum cares for her little baby, she unfortunately has to come to terms with the fact that while she hasn't gotten him hurt physically, she's hurt him much deeper emotionally. Letting herself down from the ceiling, she briefly makes her way over to the window to contemplate, accepting her responsibility for the situation and exiting his room shortly thereafter. It's not your fault. It's mine. And when she does, she's donned his jacket, a comfort that he's here to hold her safe, to protect her from the world and her own mistakes, to be there to help her through her struggles. It also parallels her leaving her sweaters at Hobie's place. She's come back here for miles, to help him. And even if it's under slightly different circumstances than why she originally followed him back to this dimension, the plan remains the same. For me, this scene where she's bundled up within a jacket paralleled her state of mind and personality from her introduction in Into the Spider-Verse, describing And I don't do friends anymore. as she walks down the streets of New York in a white puffer jacket. In both scenes, Gwen is in a vulnerable state where she is ridden with grief and guilt, no doubt with it being harder the second time as the emotions and weight of her first experience resurface as she continues to blame herself for both situations. On the train earlier, she admitted, I... I didn't know... how to tell you. And this is likely the root upon which the stemming guilt comes from. As all of her emotions manifest, she resorts to wrapping herself in the jacket, attempting to create a barrier from the outside world while doubling as something tangible that reminds her of Miles, who presumably is who she'd like to be with in order to keep her safe from all of these overwhelming feelings. In contrast to Into the Spider-Verse, rather than Gwen completely isolating herself, she instead reaches out to her other friends, which she didn't have last time. Rather than distancing herself to protect other people from her own future potential failures, she has learned that there are better and healthier coping mechanisms to move past these moments. Doubling down on her vulnerability, not being able to save her friends would place a strong doubt in her mind about her abilities, leading her to question her own judgement and capabilities, considering that this is her whole job. So by closing herself off emotionally to other people, it limits other distractions and influences that she believes could lead to further potential damage. Just to avoid any distractions. 
The ending of the movie follows Gwen as she makes her own band, since she never found the right one for her, demonstrating her growth from the start of the film where she felt as if she didn't fit in, whilst also taking a page out of Hobie's book about being her own boss. Cutting between headshots of Gwen and Miles, it represents their connection and parallels their story as it presents their similarities for a final time. This was a little longer than I thought it was going to be, but I hope it demonstrates just how great of a character Gwen is in Across the Spider-Verse, and the major role she plays in this part of the story. Undoubtedly, she will continue to play a central role in Beyond the Spider-Verse, hopefully closely alongside Miles. If you'd like another character analysis on Gwen, let me know and I can take a look at Into the Spider-Verse properly, or even another character. Anyway, if you enjoyed, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. I spent way too long on this, but I loved it nonetheless. Gwen is just amazing. But until next time, I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.